something to say. Hello everyone, and how are you doing today? My name is Charlie. Welcome to this episode of Project Shadow. You might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer C.E. Dorset, especially if you're reading my new book, Crucify My Love, or listening to the Mask of the Gods podcast, where you can hear me read the book to you. Honestly, I don't know if I'm just in a mood today, if it's because I've been suffering from severe joint pain, or... If it's because NBC Universal announced that they're going to be creating their own streaming service, I, I want to talk to you about exclusivity and why it's just a pain in the butt. Now, there are many paths to take when talking about this subject, and the first one, and the most important one, that I think that we have to bring up here is when we're talking about streaming services or any service whatsoever, if and when exclusivity is involved, we are not talking about competitors. We are not talking about a marketplace. What we are talking about is an oligar <laughs> I can never say this word, an oligopoly. It is a group of monopolies that exist, and the only real check is how much they're able to manipulate the market to get money from people. And that may sound like I'm being really harsh, but I'm not. I am a copyright holder. I am a creative person. I write books. Okay. So the government grants me a monopoly on my work. That monopoly, granted to me by copyright, will last for my lifespan plus 70 years. So no one can do anything with my work without my express permission or the permission of my estate or whoever the rights go to after I die for 70 years. That is a monopoly. Now, the purpose of copyright law, which... I'm going to be talking about copyright law in the United States because that's where I live. Copyright is one of only two laws that is expressly demanded by the Constitution. It requires that a system of patent and copyright be established in the United States for the purpose of fostering innovation. I don't think lifespan plus 70 years fosters innovation. In fact, it does the exact opposite. It, it harms innovation. There are works that are languishing. There are works by like Doc E.E. Cummings and Doc Smith, who I would love to revisit and I would love to play around in those worlds. They've been dead for quite some time and nobody's doing anything with them. They're just languishing. I mean, if you've never read any of the Lensman books, then you have no idea what I'm talking about. If you haven't read the Barzoom series, then you don't know what I'm talking about. But you see, these are completely off limits because, well, through manipulation of copyright law and trademark, the rights to exclusively control these settings, characters, worlds, and what have you, belong to individuals and companies. And even though you might not even know what Barzoom is, you, I can't really expand on it too much. I can't write my own stories that take place there. I can't reimagine the worlds that were created there. Now, I could try, but I have to be very careful because Edgar Rice Burroughs, who wrote those books, the foundation that took over his rights when he died, 
to this sneaky little thing, because a lot of his works are actually out of copyright. But they trademarked a lot of the names. Which makes it difficult to do, say, Tarzan, who he also created. It's rather ridiculous and really problematic. And is the exact opposite of its intended purpose. Stories are meant to go through cycles of reinvention. We may not like, like reboots, but every story is a reboot of something. And the more that gets caught up in copyright, the less we have to work with. So even though the works of Frank L. Baum are public domain, I would have to be very careful if I wanted to do, say, my own retelling of Oz. Because there have been others that have come about that have added to the mythos, and I have to make sure that I'm only pulling from the Baum books and not from the movies and not from the musicals or other books that have been done because they now have copyright claims over those things that they do. What is the Wicked Witch's name? If you said Alphaba, congratulations, you either read Wicked or listened to the Broadway musical. And let's be honest, you listen to the musical. That is her name from a book that was turned into a musical. That is not her name in the original work. In fact, she doesn't have a name in the original work. She is the Wicked Witch of the West. That's it. That's all we get. That's just some of the little things that I'm talking about when I say that we have to be careful not to accidentally bring in something that is copyrighted when working with something that's out of copyright. So, in these governmentally approved horrible, horrible, horrible monopolies, of which I, like I said, participate with my own work, we are then asked to grant exclusivity rights. And I don't mind that for a little bit. For example, Amazon likes you to give them exclusive rights to your work. And they do this in 90-day chunks, and I generally allow my books to be up there for 90 days in that exclusivity period because most people who buy books do so from Amazon. And I get perks. I get my book enrolled in Kindle Unlimited. So if you're a Kindle Unlimited subscriber, you can read my book basically for free for the cost of the subscription. But if I want to do other things with my book, I can't. My book can't be anywhere else. I can't even give away free copies of my book. Because Amazon has the exclusive rights to the digital text until that exclusivity period is done. And we can talk about whether or not that's a good idea or not. But the problem that we're having is in the new world of streaming services that are starting to take over. Be it Disney+, Plus, Netflix, Hulu... CBS All Access, mm. fill in the blank. These services are basing their entire existence around, I would say, limited exclusivity. And at least for now, that is true. Now, why do I say limited exclusivity? Because they are still, generally, for most of these products, making the work available elsewhere for money at another date. So as far as streaming goes, see, this is how they're getting around the idea that they're a monopoly and why this part probably won't go away. Even if we get to a point where it's not necessarily profit profitable for them to do it. So for example, I want to be watching American Gods. I enjoyed season one, hated the experience of the stars app, I don't want to sign up for stars again, so I'm not, but they will eventually make it available to buy. And I'm assuming it's going to be about the same price as season one for season two, and I'll just pick up season two when it's available to buy, and then I own it, I don't have to worry about paying streaming rights for it, and blah blah blah, I get to see it then. 
But like I said, that's more of a defensive move on their part because they can't call themselves, they can't be called a monopoly because they can point to the iTunes store and the Google Play store and places like that, um, the Amazon store, and go see, look, you can get this elsewhere. It's not really a monopoly. We just have exclusivity for the streaming rights. And take that for whatever it is. <laughs> The problem with locking everything up and streaming like this is it stagnates the entire system. They're not, in fact, incentivized to make new content. You might think that they would be, but when we look at the actual numbers, 72%, for example, of all viewership minutes on Netflix go to watching reruns. Now, that may be people watching it for the first time or because they're watching it because they just love the series and want to watch it again, like with some of my rewatches that I do on Netflix, because I know I'm guilty of that. But it shows where the demand is. You have to go to, I think, the number five most streamed by viewer minutes on Netflix before you get to an original program, and that's Orange is the New Black. So it doesn't incentivize them to make new content. Think about it. We've talked about this on the show quite a bit. The one thing that excites me about the possibility of a Disney Plus app is access to the Disney vaults. There are a lot of shows that I remember watching when I was a kid that I'm hoping are going to be on there and will be as interesting to me as an adult as they were back then. I remember shows on... Um, hosted by Walt Disney that were on topics like Imagineering and coming up with characters and storytelling and that's my cat. Hi, Jinx. Um, and I would love to watch those again because the idea of getting to watch Walt Disney talk about storytelling, no matter what you think of the man and his personal politics, that would be fascinating. And I haven't been able to find access to those. Those were part of the wonderful, the wonderful world of Disney that was on television when I was a kid. And I'm kind of hoping that they're going to make archival material like that available on the streaming service. That would be amazing. And of course, yeah, I'm excited about The Mandalorian and all of that. But everything else, I don't know. We'll have to see. See, Disney is going to have to, at least for someone like me and for my household, really step up its game when it comes to the original content game. Because I kind of already own all of the original Disney movies and Pixar movies and Netflix, I'm sorry, and Marvel movies that I want to watch. And it's kind of part of my routine to buy the new ones when they come out. So if the streaming service doesn't offer me something that makes me want to stay or really excite me, then I'm not going to stay there. And in the end run, all it's really going to do is bring harm to Netflix and Hulu and any of the aggregate services that we used to rely on because that content is going to be moved away. They're going to claim... And remember, you're going to hear this over and over and over again, that a new competitor, a new competitor, a new new competitor is coming into the field. That's not true at all. When you look at these streaming apps, they're really no different than the old cable channels that we had back in the day, except for we get to buy them a la carte. I don't necessarily have a problem with that, but when they're talking about themselves as competitors... My parents watch RFD almost all the time. That's the channel they watch. It's actually a channel. It's a real channel. Have you ever heard of it? <laughs> I know I didn't until they started talking about it a lot. It's like old country music shows and stuff about rural living. I I'd never heard of it. But they watch it almost exclusively. And that's what is going to happen. This is one of the biggest problems that we have with the new Star Trek. Other than, you know, it's writing and direction and other issues like that. 
Star Trek Discovery will never be as big as any of the previous Star Treks, even if it was superior. Let's go into a magical fantasy land where Star Trek Discovery is actually a better show than any of the Star Treks that came before it. Because it's behind a paywall, most people will never know. And is that really innovation? If nobody knows? So, what are we going to do in this brave new future? Well, we're going to endure it until the bubble bursts. And this is a bubble. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. This is as much a bubble as when the internet first started. We're going to see a whole bunch of people try to do this. We're going to see a whole bunch of people fail. And we're going to see a whole bunch of things that are for niche audiences find niche audiences. But with the advent of exclusivity, we're going to start seeing fights over that. I love comic books. So I pay for Marvel Unlimited so I can read my comics. One of the main reasons I subscribe to DC Universe is f to read comics. I love the idea that they have original programs on there, and I wish they were better and that I liked them more. I do like that they have legacy shows on there and enjoy rewatching those from time to time. But what's going to happen when the Warner Brothers streaming service launches? You know, that Time Warmer, the yeah, Time Warmer, Time Warner streaming that they're telling us is coming later this year, early next year. Well, who's going to get what? Are the Batman movies going to be on both or just one? Are they going to move them over? What's going to happen to the Warner Brothers content when that happens? What's going to happen if there's a runaway hit on DC Universe? Is it going to stay there or are they going to grant the exclusivity rights over to the bigger to the Warner Brothers catalog or vice versa? Are they going to now say if I want to watch my new Batman TV series or whatever, I have to subscribe to the Time Warner app as well? Disney's already doing that. I'm going to have to subscribe to the Disney Plus app to get the new shows that they're working on in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And if I want to continue to get the comics, at least for now, I also have to subscribe to Marvel Unlimited. And maybe that'll be a good thing. I don't know. But it's not competition. See, if we wanted real competition in this market, and it's something that we fetishize as a culture, then... We would legally limit exclusivity periods. See, I don't have a problem with that. Me granting Amazon a three-month exclusivity period that I can extend to my heart's desire. Okay, that's nice. But after three months, if I want to put my work up on Wattpad and Scribd and, you know, iBooks and wherever else I want to put it up, I can if I want to. And there's a good chance that I'll do that. Because I really do feel like the best way for me to make the most out of my work is to have it to be as discoverable as, discoverable as it can be for the most amount of people. Now having said that, does that mean that I necessarily have to put my book in any of these places? No. It doesn't. I can if I want, but I don't have to. And what I'm wondering is what would happen if we had a mandatory limit, a term limit on exclusivity? Because it wouldn't hurt the products. Let's be honest, three months after something comes out, if you haven't seen it, oh my goodness, it's so passe. Right? It's true. It's, it's a problem that I come up against while doing this show is if I want to talk about something and make sure that that episode gets a lot of listens, I need to watch it within a week, sometimes less. Like, I haven't watched the next chapter of Sabrina yet, the next part of Sabrina, The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. I'm planning on it. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. And more than likely, when I do, the episode where I talk about it won't get nearly as enough download, as many downloads as it would have if I had done it at the time. There is a coolness factor to getting in on the ground floor. So fine, 
grant them that, that three months, six months. We do that for movies in the theater. Why not treat this the same way? And then after that, let it go out. Let it go broad. Make it go broad. Because what I want is actual competition. And competition for me doesn't mean necessarily the best stories, because there is no competing with Harry Potter. There isn't. I can't write my own Harry Potter, and none of these companies can make their own Harry Potter. Harry Potter is what Harry Potter is. Now, I can create my own Young Wizard series. See, The Worst Witch, for example. Or my own version of the story. See, Percy Jackson, right? But I can't compete directly with Harry Potter. That's not a thing that's possible. So we need to get that out of our heads at the very beginning of this conversation, that we're not going to be competing on IP. In fact, that's quite often counterproductive. So what do I actually want competition for? Features. Reliability. I want it to work the way I want it to work. I, I want them to be wowing me with their service and compelling me to pay for their service because it's actually the best. One of the reasons why I get most of my entertainment from Netflix and Hulu, I'm sorry, well, technically it's YouTube and Netflix as I watch more than anything, some shows on Hulu. I, I don't find Amazon Prime to be all that reliable. We've had problems with its streaming here and it's because we live in the center of the country and we're probably at one of those nexus points where we're not all that close to any of the server farms. So occasionally we'll have the show drop out and we'll have to go back in and restart it. And sometimes the app doesn't load right. And we have all kinds of problems and we do for a lot of other shows as well. Tubi has a lot of shows that I'd be interested in watching, but their interface is terrible. And I have to physically write down what episode I'm on in a series when I stop watching because it doesn't track that because they don't care. They just have rights to things and a streaming platform and they do stuff. I want these platforms to be competing. What are the best features? What are the features that will make this great? Why don't I get special features like I would if I get a DVD? Where are those? They're not on Netflix. They're not on Hulu. They're not on Amazon Prime. I can't see those for any of these things. HBO, kind of. They have that after the episode thing where they talk to Dan and Dave about what happened on Game of Thrones. That's the closest to that. But if we had actual competition, then I would be getting my DVD extras because I love them. Give me my behind the scenes content and how they did the special effects and why the writers did what they did with the series and my director's commentary. I would love that. I'd also love, you know, X-Ray to work on everything. See, Amazon Prime has this feature where if you pause it, it's supposed to tell you like what music is playing in the background and who the various actors are. And for their original programs, that tends to work fairly well, but a lot of people don't put the time into it, and Amazon surely doesn't put the time in it to make it work. So when I'm watching those shows, and I'm curious about who somebody is, unless it's an original, I have to load up IMDb and look it up. That could be baked in. And honestly, the features that we probably want in a streaming service are features we don't even know we want because someone hasn't invented them yet. When Netflix first went to streaming, I was happy with the DVDs, and it seemed ludicrous that I would want a box in my living room. And then we decabled, and we decabled re really early. And then I wanted everything streaming. And I played with apps back in those early days that did fun things like viewing parties. I can't remember the name of the app. Its icon was an owl, and it had this wonderful feature. It was called a viewing party. You could invite people in, and then when you clicked play, it would synchronize the movie for everybody that was watching, and you had a chat room. 
and you could watch the movie with people and talk to them in real time. It was so much fun. I really enjoyed doing it. But they lost all their streaming rights to things. So the company ended up going under. So that didn't happen. But that's the thing that could happen. That would be really fun. I've got family and friends all over the country. It would be great if we could actually have some kind of joint watching experience. That we didn't have to coordinate on our own. That would be fun. Maybe something like that. I don't know. That's the point, though. We will never know because they're competing over exclusivity to IP and not over how good their streaming services are. See, they want me to be locked in because I'm a fan of the Marvel movies or Star Wars. And yeah, Disney Plus... They're probably going to have me, at least for a little while, because I love me a Pixar movie, and I like me a Marvel thing, and I like me a Star Wars thing. But they have no incentive to do anything innovative at all on their platform to make it exciting, to make it better than the viewing experience everywhere else. In fact, their main incentive is to make it at least as good as everything else that's out there. And that's not really competition. And that's not really innovation. And that's not what we all signed up for. And that's what we need to realize as we're moving further and further into this new age of streaming services with exclusive content that you have to subscribe either to that particular series by buying it when it comes out or by paying the subscription fee to have access to it, then they don't have any incentive whatsoever at all to make the platform better. And this is where I kind of wish I had an anchor ad here because that's why I like working with them. They're incentivized to make podcasting as good as possible because, yeah, you can listen via the Anchor app. You can listen via the website at anchor.fm. But they also push the content out so that it's available everywhere. So they're trying to make podcasting better for me as a user, for me as a podcast maker, and for you as a user. Which is why I often ask you to go over there, download the app, and send me a voice message. Because it's the easiest way to do it. Which, if you would like, just go download the Anchor app, follow Project Shadow, and send me a voice message about what you'd like to hear me discuss on the show. Let's make this our podcast. If you like this episode, no matter what app you're listening to me on, if it allows you to rate either this episode or the podcast in general, please do so. That helps out um, immensely tells the algorithms to share them with more people and that would be awesome if you get a buck you can throw my way down in the show notes you'll see a link to the community support page if you click that you can join the project at the one dollar five dollar ten dollar levels that money helps me do everything that i do thank you to everybody who does that if you don't have any money right now to give or you don't feel like doing it that's fine that's perfectly all right but if you know anybody you think would like the episode please share That helps out immensely. Yeah. I don't really know what the landscape's going to look like next year when we're in the throes of streaming Armageddon. But I'll be here and I'll be talking about it. If you want to talk to me about it, you can follow me over on Twitter. I'm C.E. Dorset over there. You can find links to all my social media accounts over at projectshadow.com. And don't forget, if you haven't already, check out my new book, Crucify My Love. Currently available exclusively over on Amazon, or you can get the audiobook, which is out as a podcast. Just look, just look for Mask of the Gods, or go to maskofthegods.com, and you'll find it there. Thank you so much for everything. And until next time, and don't forget, tomorrow's episode's going to be late, and it's going to be about Endgame. Until next time, 
have the fun. Bye.